Well, here we are, Andrew. Uh, BTWL, 12th of March, my son's birthday. And I knew it was going to be tough. And I apologise for it being a little bit late. But hopefully some of the sentiments get across and value to the summit that yourself and Mark Jeffrey, who is a global leader in technology, innovation for tennis and new ways of thinking around the delivery of tennis um, with uh, wonderful events like the Winning Summit and Between the White Lines. So gents, thank you for inviting me to today's presentation. Uh, my name's Courtney Smith. I am a side player in this sport in that I play it regularly in my personal life, but from a professional level, I'm an amateur. And what I mean by amateur is I've come back into the sport with the belief that there are some changes that have taken place that need to be looked at based on my experience on stepping out of the sport for a decade after playing all my life through to a high level um, whilst I was in full-time employee at 30 to coming back in my 40s when I had kids that had come of age to be able to play this wonderful sport such that I could hand that, um, that love that I have for the game down to them. Uh, coming back to the sport has been really interesting, to be frank. Um, I've noticed that there is a shift in the way in which the, um, the parties engage. And when I say parties, I'm talking about, for the most part, the national governing bodies, uh, state governing bodies, uh, the coaches, and of course the clubs and their constituency, which is the player, the member, etc. So I step back into tennis and my first experience uh, as I bring a bucket of balls onto the court to knock some balls around with my young boy is the coach telling me I can't do it. Um, not the greatest experience and something that I, uh, I, I vehemently think is incorrect. Um, this sport is a sport where when you're a member of the club or you're keen to grow, there should be no boundary. I understand and, I, and I'm fully about protecting livelihood, um, but what gets lost in the protection of livelihood is the opportunity. It's the concept um, that is thrown to me of the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset. And I think tennis is in a concept around fixed mindset um, and generally driven through a couple of reasons. One, we have a fixed mindset that we can just turn the switch back on to those halcyon days of the 80s. I don't believe that's the case although there are elements I think we need to turn back on. Um, I think there's a concept that um, in a fixed mindset that my, my patch is my patch. Um, you can't engage in my patch because I own my patch and therefore when, when and if you step into my patch and I feel threatened, I come back um, with, with, with what I would call a negative approach as opposed to an engagement approach. As someone that wasn't wanting to be a tennis coach, and chose to take a different career, I was actually the best person for the coach at the time to bring into the club because I had the wherewithal, the knowledge, the expertise, and a group of people that came from my community that would have followed me because of my experiences in coaching basketball and footy and all these other things. So opportunity lost, really, at the end of the day. Um, take a view at the club land, and I see a differentiation in social engagement than I did when I when I left the sport. Uh, the number of participating teams in Victorian pennant, the number of participating teams in seniors Saturday afternoon comps, the lack of social Sunday barbecues, all of these things were uh, and continue to weigh on my mind, um, driven because volunteering is changing. And COVID, wow, thanks COVID last year, you've changed a lot. Um, not so sure if it's, it's been good for volunteers, it's probably been great for tennis. So fast forward to um, 2021, uh, I spent the last 12-ish months looking at the marketplace, assessing different avenues, looked at technology because that's my expertise, and I'll talk a little about that later, but ultimately arrived on the fact that we don't have a single medium by which we can engage in a really positive environment and a positive way that's grassroots oriented, uh, orientated and allows for um, the conversation to be captured in a positive manner and trapped as opposed to social environments which are built for their own purposes 
and hook people into group chats where the history is lost almost forever. And classification of information is only available to the social media um, juggernaut. So hopefully today I can provide you some concepts, some ideas, and maybe a reason to join or involve yourself in Activate.Tennis. It is a platform that has been designed from a not-for-profit perspective with the view of giving back to clubs, allowing them to provide services to their members and speak out about the positive things that happen in their clubs such that other clubs can learn. Also, the same goes with coaches, the ability to run unique events, to be able to involve themselves in positive and engaging uh, membership um, um, engagement and student engagement and parent engagement, uh, and ultimately shine a bright big torch on tennis as one of the best sports, no, sorry, I'll take a step back, the best sport ever invented. What I do know is this will not happen from the top. The governing bodies that we have uh, have done an amazing job to create one of the most amazing events. So I'm fortunate to be in Melbourne and I get to attend every year and what an event that is, the Australian Open. But with the massive coffers that came out the back of it, we've reinvested in growing the event and ultimately growing the event has led to profile for Tennis Australia and has led to opportunity for Tennis Australia to show the world how to run an event uh, for tennis and ultimately have given them other, other pathways to do that globally. Um, what I believe we've lost is a little bit of a connection between the top and the bottom. Um, we have a pyramid, which I'll talk about in a second, and at the end of the day, the buyers in Australia for tennis on the ground, at the grassroots clubs, are the parents and the players. Not the viewers, they're a subset of that audience, but the players. And I think that we're losing some of those and we're getting a new ilk of participant in parent that has never played, doesn't understand the etiquettes and needs to be part of a community and built into that community to learn to play too. Because this is an addictive sport. Once you get the bug, it's hard to, hard to leave and it's a unique sport because it is a sport where the coach has so much influence and has the luxury of being paid. If we can turn that influence and that luxury into a, into a, into a driving force for tennis, then I think tennis has got to be the sport that's going to be very hard to, to knock off the map if we get it right. I'm conscious of time, so I'll try and push through some of these things very quickly. As I mentioned before, this sport is about the parent and the player at the grassroots level. We have multi-tiers in the way in which our tennis um, programs are formatted, and it starts at the very top at our National Governing Body, Tennis Australia. Um, they drive down programs to the state bodies, and the state bodies work closely with associations and clubs, depending on which state, to deliver competition programs and pathways for players. In some instances that's splintered, in some instances that's cohesive, but the one binding piece of all of that is that most of the players that enter the tennis foray enter in through or, or align to a coach, whether that be a new parent and a membership family, or whether that be a new student learning to play tennis for the first time and looking to join a competition, the coach is the centre point. And I'd like to say that I think there's a huge opportunity for coaches around Australia to come together, to be part of a network, to not compete negatively, to compete positively for the growth of this great sport. And if we do this correctly, and we do it in conjunction with the associations and the clubs, and we give back, like I was given back by the coaches in our region when they were running McDonald's squad and, um, and uh, shell squads and these sorts of um, um, environments for the growth of your, um, your pathways players, uh, then I think if we can get it right again, and we've got it right sections, I'm not knocking this on the whole, I'm saying we could be better. Um, we need to engage with our parents and our players better. We need to work with them in a way that's modern, that allows for them to participate in what I call a pay society, and allows for them to have the flexibility to align with the myriad of other competing um, options for their wallet. We have over 615 head coaches in Australia with probably an average of 200 pupils each. 
that's 120,000 players in Australia with, with a lot less playing in competition from my statistical um, viewpoint. Um, the membership base is also very hard to capture and whilst we're doing research, I was um, shattered to see the falling off of a number of clubs as they are disaggregated out of this um, out of this environment because they just can't provide enough opportunity for players at club level. So my question to the audience is: Are we at a crossroads? Um, have we got a point in time where the problems? are so, so challenging that we can't come together to solve them. I would debate that the answer to that question is going to be wholly based on the motivations between the way in which volunteering and clubs maintain and the engagement with the coaches as they run their businesses in this environment. There's lots of talk out there um, around major changes taking place that have a, a, a significant um, impact on the way coaches can control their destiny. And I think that the challenge we've got is to find the balance. Um, we have to find a way to get our coaches to act like volunteers in the growth of the game, knowing full well that they're doing 40 plus hours on court a week, and we need to do that in a way that gives them certainty. And the current environment is very uncertain. And I don't think if I had a choice, well, I know if I, if I had a choice, I wouldn't enter back into the sport as a coach. It's fraught with danger. Tenure is, 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 is questionable. Um, club contracts are, are becoming harder um, and, and, and biased towards clubs and councils. Um, and ultimately, uh, the expectations when you're sitting behind a group of volunteers that can change on a whim, um, that that expectation change also comes with its own weight and, and pain. So I've listed some problems here. Um, I'm happy to send the, the document around and get those added to. The point of the matter is that we have these three key elements within our, in our sport that we need to bring together to make sure our sport flourishes against those other sports that appear to be doing a better job at grassroots. So yes, it's time to stop some negative chatter. Uh, I get caught up in the Facebook um, uh, groups, I must admit, and sometimes I chime in, and more often than not now, I've chosen to, to listen and observe. Uh, there's a reason why there's negative chatter, because not everyone believes that tennis is performing to its potential. So from my perspective, I think it's time that we get positive, and we do it as a, as a, as a unified approach, and so, Let's, let's start on a positive. Activate Tennis seeks to become a trusted brand owned entirely by the grassroots community, clubs, coaches, and anyone that wants to help me on this, on this journey to provide a framework for tennis activation and positive speech. We're there to serve our coaches, our clubs, and association players who ultimately want to see this great game thrive. I, I add a, a little bit of a spin on this and, and a bit of a gag, which is around the concept that change is inevitable. We have to be part of a change program. And, and the reasons why that the tennis manufacturers have made amazing inroads into this sport over the years is that they are constantly changing their offerings. And I think we need to be the same in tennis. We don't need to change the sport of tennis, but we need to think about the way in which we engage with our audience using tennis as the primary attraction point. There's lots of ways that tennis can give to, to our community and there's lots of value propositions that haven't really been tapped appropriately for what it can give. And I talk about things like corporate days, large for-purpose charity events. Um, these are the things that I've looked at and I believe strongly if we can come together can be delivered and will be better for tennis and the positioning that we seek in, in, in the communities in which we offer our sport. The platform will be designed to recognise the importance of the professionals in our sport and how, how they can add value to the growth pathways of our kids, both from a human perspective, because we all know tennis is a game 
that adds value from a human perspective, not just from a sports perspective, um, but also to add value to um, the, the development of our communities where the community can come together and play together, which can't or is very challenging to facilitate in other sports. It's a shout out to our champions, the true champions of our sport, the people that volunteer hours and hours a week, month on month, that have basically sat on committees for years, that have ensured that our clubs sustain and maintain. Our challenge moving forward is that when you become a committee member and you become a legacy committee member, you don't want to impact or risk the club. Therefore, you don't spend on outcomes. In today's world, People need to see, hear, touch and feel you. And if you're not publicising on a regular basis, you won't be heard. So we need to help our volunteers and we need to help grassroots. We need to make sure that we offer a really fun, engaging and social environment for tennis players, not just our kids when they're coming into the sport, but our parents. Because I'm worried that we're going to see a gap in parent play that is actually and ultimately impacting competition tennis. If you draw a, a sine wave graph, we're probably going to see that as we have this wonderful multicultural society and 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 an entrance that haven't played tennis before but love the idea of their kids playing the sport, we will see a resurgence in players that will become parents. But I think if you looked at the statistics, and I have, um, you will see that the playing parent is drifting um, off. In our, in our scope as one of the paying participants of our sport and one of the advocates and, and strong um, message carriers of our sport. We share our wins, we shout out those positive stories and we do it in a single framework which highlights and spotlights tennis. I like to think that with adversity comes opportunity. We've had COVID, We've seen a lock, a lockdown of the the game completely. Yet when the doors opened, and tennis was given its literal right of passage because it is innately a safe sport in regards to contagions, um, it flourished and it boomed and people played. But I would be very interested to get the statistics, and they'll come through in the next six months or twelve months of how many people that played in that period of time stayed after that period of time. We have our kids in the world of internet and mobile, gamification, um, driven to be looking at screens. We have parents that have, are disengaged because at the end of the day, they've got so much on their plate. They're two income families, they're working hard, they've got um, an, an amount of disposable income, they follow the Joneses down the street to basketball and footy, the team sports pull in kids from the grassroots because they're team oriented and we have all of these factors impacting what tennis is as an opportunity against other sports and, and particularly where people apply their time. I think it's an opportunity and I think if we do it as a collective and we tie and bind the, our community which is club, coach, association and player parent in a really positive environment, then I can't see how this sport can't continue to grow and flourish. The world changed. When I started my venture and I started this look, I actually was looking at a commercial delivery. I, interestingly enough, I thought we had to gamify tennis. I thought we had to get tennis into the new ilk of the Fortnite-esque style of delivery. And I think there's gonna be a place for it. And in the 12 months to 18 months that I've been in the technology sphere of evaluating, looking at, talking to, assessing technologies for tennis, I have seen a change in the thinking of both the consumer user and the technology provider. And so I'm seeing consumerization that wasn't there. And consumerization leads to, obviously, a mega market. And when you touch mega markets, and you provide really cool stuff to mega markets, you create a vacuum. And in that vacuum, if tennis can be brought into it, then I'm all for it. But we need to be smart. We need to think about the application of technology for our businesses, our clubs, businesses being coaches, our clubs in regards to what they offer our members and, and what value they give back to our members. 
and of course then how we, we, we engage with our players so that they feel that tennis has got those edges, those values that that technology adds um, an increased desire to play. And so we talked about automatic rating systems using analytics. I brought a couple of mojo systems into the country with uh, a really cool coach down in, in, in Murdoch who owns a little center down there, adopting that and using that in his coaching sessions to improve um, coach performance and increase coach revenue. Um, Slinger bag, what a, what a story coming out of um, coming out of the crowdsourcing marketplace. Uh, you know, who would have thought that they could they could have a thousand people buy um, buy uh, ball machines that you could put in the back of your car for under a thousand dollars? It's changing the market. They've done amazing things, and congratulations to them. Companies like In Out out of California, who have built uh, NetPost AI, Tennis AI out of South Australia, who do post uh, post edit assessment of games. Um, positioning, forehand percentages, backhand percentages. We have tennis coach apps coming out that will in, in improve the engagement between coach, player, and parent. Um, we have uh, all sorts of um, interactive, engaging ways in which to play ball sports from multi-ball, which is a wall-based tennis, um, soccer, um, yeah, engagement layer that can be put in a squash court or put on a wall at a tennis club. And then we have things like um, a decor um, who Mr. Mr. Decor um, has built where you can customize rackets online to find your own look, feel, um, balance points. Um, and that's all done through the internet um, and delivered um, globally. I mean, this is an amazing time to be in the technology elements of sport. And it's an amazing time to be in tennis because tennis is a really cool gamification sport. It's individual, it can be pl played as an individual, and, and you can play it under gamification. So opportunities to see VR, um, we've seen um, a rating system that has exploded because it's allowed coaches to do unique things and players to assess themselves globally. Uh, and then we have, of course, VR, where uh, Gregory Gettinger, who also speaking, um, has provided a completely new way to train using virtual reality. It's exciting, and I think the community needs to get behind it, and the coaches particularly need to start leveraging up their knowledge about where this sits and bringing that back to clubs. At the end of the day, if we have a vibrant and active coach, and a vibrant and active club community, we create a crowd. And everyone knows that when you create a crowd, you get a crowd. So I'm a strong believer that if we get the right positive messages out there, we put the right programs in place between club and coach, and ultimately even in associations on the way in which they design their competition formats and their pathways programs for their kids around squads and all these sorts of things, I think that we can create crowds all over this great nation. So how do we grow the crowd? Well, if you break it down, we have to grow it through our social play. We have to grow it at the grassroots levels. And we have to make it such that it's consumable, it's easy in the life that we lead, the busy lives that we lead, and that it's fun. But most of all, we need to find out how we get back to that point where you get to play and then you get to play. And what I mean by play is engage socially, both on court and off court, such that that positive endorphin release that you get from being part of a face-to-face -face community brings you back time and time again. It may not be competition. It may be just as we looked at, it might be something unique. It might be something like golf did with the hold and scramble, a, a, a super cool um, national social event built on a handicap system, um, using handicaps to provide a methodology to grade people fairly um, and, and, and then delivered through coaches and, and clubs in a feeder style program with prizes and, um, and profile and all those things that you get out of, out of things like Fortnite, hold and scramble, which is now Volkswagen Scramble, 
They've done over 1.6 million people paying at least $120 to $250 a head. Do the math. We have corporate environments that need social wellness days, wellness for their employees with WorkSafe, um, WorkSafe increasing their projections on mental health issues in the workplace, tennis, I ran one at our local club, what a day. Our guys loved it, I had players that had never played, hadn't picked up a racket for 10 years, and they all came back, and they all, all played. We created a handicap system, and out of that handicap system, we created a little tournament, and that tournament was run within two hours. We had winners, and it was as fair as you could have got. There was excitement, there was trepidation on who was gonna be able to handle it or not, but everyone joined in, and everyone had a ball. There's so many opportunities here, guys, that if we come together and we brainstorm this stuff, there's no reason why we can't get activation, both locally and state-based, and even better, nationally and internationally. Our target should be a million players, but not a million people that picked up a racket, a million real tennis players, playing regularly, volunteering, and assisting clubs, and just being part of that tennis community. So who's gonna lead? Is it the peak body? Is it the club? Well, based on statistics, based on experience, and based on what I've seen in the short time I've been back in the sport, I think it needs to be the coach. The coach is motivated by money, motivated by his community, has been a player and has loved the game and therefore espouses with passion the reason why people should play the game. And the coach at the end of the day is the one that most people go to when they want to improve their, their tennis. Working closely with clubs in fair, fair relationships that make sense, there should be no reason why that cohesive structure can't be adopted nationally and the coaches actually can't create tenure doesn't mean people can be stale and just let, let, let the gravy train ride. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about having proper relationships in place that measure KPIs, key performance indicators, from both the club's perspective and the coach's perspective to ensure that the game is grown at the local level in the local region or area in which they operate. If we can do that, and if we can do that correctly from grassroots, then the game will grow by 10 to 15% and everyone's patch will grow by the same because word of mouth in tennis is, is, is as good as any marketing you'll ever get. We need the coaches to grow up in terms of their business acumen. We need them to build their social media networks. We need them to, to build their abilities to deliver quality information flow back to parents and back to kids. And we need to use technology in a way that it can add value. The clubs are no different. The only problem there we've got is volunteers. And volunteers by nature of, of what I know in the market currently, that's a diminishing, um, a diminishing uh, return in that they're not coming in um, with any fervour. In fact, uh, I would say that, that we have a massive issue facing us in the next 10 years around how clubs will actually operate. So it's time to embrace the truth that the real reason why the sport's not running is because we haven't driven it properly. And so I'm saying and advocating that coaches, yes, coaches, but with clubs, you both need to drive this thing forward. Humans like change. If a temperature changes, if the phone rings, it's exciting, it adds a conversation streak, and it gets your attention. Our tennis community needs the phone to ring. And I think that activate.tennis provides a framework that can potentially deliver a positive value proposition to both coach and club to bind them in a positive way such that, that the community sees that tennis is a quality sport run by quality people. Um, and, and I think if that's seen, then the sport will take care of the rest. Because once you enter this sport and you get a positive exchange, it's very hard to leave. It's not only a sport that creates sports people, it's a sport that creates better humans. 
And I think that we need to really start thinking about that messaging on how we deliver that to our up and coming parents and our up and coming players. Tennis is a sport that was built on great etiquette, history, and, and, and as a result, handed down through the generations, it's a sport that we all know commands respect, both from the way in which you engage with the sport, because it's so challenging, but also from the way in which you engage with your opposition. It's a gladiatorial sport, and it teaches you a number of things in life about how to be better, about how to deal with adversity, how to do it by yourself, how to engage with people that, that want to take you off your seat or, or knock you off the, knock you off the, um, the top. Um, all of these things, you become better through tennis. Tennis clubs are the best. As a 12-year-old boy playing in the local Sunday afternoon comp down at Flinders Tennis Club, little country club down in, uh, on the Morning Peninsula, Victoria, there was nothing better than being part of that community and having an opportunity to pretend that I could possibly be the best in the club. Now, I was lucky that I actually got to that point. But it was that stimulation I got as a kid, playing with our community, enjoying the sausage sizzle afterwards and the talk and the chit chat and the table tennis in the club rooms and all of those engagements that made me love this sport so much. And to be honest, so did little elements outside of the sport, like back tennis at school. There's so much conversation going on around whether we should have multi, multi direction in, our, in the way in which we engage tennis players. Should we allow for pickleball? And should we allow for a paddle and these other sports? Should we modify the game? Should we change the scoring? For the most part, I'd say no. But what I can say is that I have a little backyard court in my house and it's small. And when I engage with my mates on that court, they all become tennis players. They don't become backyard, back tennis players. They all for a moment in time become tennis players. And that's how we stimulate tennis from different angles. And clubs, I think, need to change on that, on that thinking and need to start to consider the other ways in which they can engage to bring tennis players to the, to the court. Coaches need to be major influencers. I've mentioned it before, I'm not gonna harp on it again. They're absolutely pivotal. We're lucky we have professionals in this sport. If, I will say this right now, if tennis didn't have coaches, I would say that tennis would be half the sport it is now. It's a big statement, but I think it's the truth. And so we're lucky because there's sports out there that don't have coaches to the capacity that tennis does, that have professionalized the pathways and the engagement at the start of the sport with individual players. That's a luxury. Go and talk to go and talk to footy and go and talk to these other areas who have to get all volunteers for every element within the program. It's tough and it's challenging. We're lucky. We need to develop programs that coaches can leverage and we need to work together in, in building out our, our, our sport, the sport of tennis. So I, I question you in closing, why be part of Activate Tennis? Well, my statement is this. Firstly, it's free. It'll cost you nothing. There's lots of things we're building and we have a launch date coming on the 26th for beta release. Um, I'll allow, uh, announce that into the, in, into the market shortly and I will be looking at small test clubs and, and coaching um, businesses that can provide